This is episode 330 of JumbleThink. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to JumbleThink, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality too. Our guest on today's show is Dario Satui. More about Dario in a moment. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, you've never subscribed to JumbleThink, head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts and search for JumbleThink and click that subscribe button. To make it even easier, all you have to do is head on over to jumblethink.com and you'll find links to places like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Pandora, and more. Now let's jump into today's conversation. Hey there, friends. Welcome to JumbleThink. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host, We have a really special conversation I am so excited to be sharing with you today. Our guest is Dario Satui. Now, years ago when my wife and I first got married, we lived in Northern California. One of our favorite things to do was to go on adventures, to to find fun and explore and discover. This often looked like a road trip, maybe leading us to ski in Lake Tahoe, a trip that I loved, but my wife really didn't. Or maybe go to Southern California, spend some time at Disneyland or Warner Brothers Studios, or to go to the beach and visit friends in Newport Beach. But often for a day trip or a weekend getaway, we would jump in the car, leave Chico, maybe on a hot summer Northern California day or a beautiful fall day, and we'd jump in the car, we'd leave Chico, we would drive through the almond orchards, drive through the walnut orchards, drive through the rice fields, cut over from I-5 to Napa Valley on the north side. We'd end up in Calistoga, the north end of, of the Napa Valley. We would wind our way down Highway 29 or St. Helena Highway through Rutherford and Oakville and sometimes end up in San Francisco. But always when we went, we would stop at these amazing wineries with amazing landscapes, with incredible architecture, with really warm people and, of course, really amazing wines. We'd stop at places like Chateau Montalina or August Briggs or the Hess wineries. But there was always one winery that stood out as our favorite for many reasons. It was this place called Castella di Amorosa. And it, and it, it was awesome. It had great wine. It had amazing people. But it had this killer castle, epic castle, modeled after the castles of Italy and done in a way that felt authentic in every way. Now, you might already have guessed, but the guy who created that castle... His name's Dario Satui. But before he ever started Castello, he started V. Satui. He traveled Europe. He fell in love with architecture. He dreamed big. He started with small beginnings. He's just a really cool guy doing amazing things and taking the risk to step out when other people thought he was crazy. Well, let's not waste any more time. Let's join our conversation with today's guest, Dario Satui. We are here with Dario Satui. Dario, thanks so much for taking time out to be with us here at JumbleThink. Thank you for including me. I'm super excited to chat with you. You are a dreamer, and not only a dreamer, but somebody that actually creates their dreams. I I love, I mean, you started or restarted Visa Tui, uh, which was a family lineage. You started Castello di Amorosa, and you uh, have a castle that you've built. You've done all of these things. Before we dive into like learning about some of these things, how how did this passion to create and when did that start for you? I think that one is born a certain way. I have no mechanical ability. Uh, I, uh, most things I can't do very well or not at all. But I think I was born uh, to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I've been doing it since I was nine years old and I uh, did it through high school, through college. My mother thought she was paying my college uh, <laughs> expenses. She wasn't even paying my liquor bill. But uh, <laughs> but I, I always had cash in my pocket. I could, 
I always figure something out, a way to make money. I love the story of you, you're a fourth generation vintner making wines, but somewhere along the line, because of prohibition, that story was kind of lost for you. How did you find that passion of winemaking again when that had changed for your family? My relatives had their winery, um, start, which started in 1885 in San Francisco. And prior to the 06 earthquake, there were a lot of wineries in San Francisco, Oakland, Marin, uh, Richmond. Um, and it made sense. The roads were so bad. If you had bottled the wine, say, in Napa County, uh, you probably would have broken a fair amount of bottles before you ever got it to the barge to take you across the bay. And um, and and the customers were in the urban areas. So my relatives, once they uh, disbanded the winery, they continued typical Italian to live um, upstairs from where they used to produce wine. And so uh, when I'd go with my parents to visit uh, my uncles and aunts, um, they tell me the stories. The place still reeked of wine. I'd look at the photographs. Uh, the cellars were still full of uh, barrels and ovals, and so um, so I I thought maybe they could restart it and then teach me, and someday I could take it over. Well, that never happened. Uh, they were doing well in other businesses, and then they were, at a certain point they were too old. So I decided after finishing college and living in Europe for a couple of years. Uh, that I would do it. I had uh, $5,000, and my mother gave me three more, and I had uh, no knowledge <laughs> of winemaking or the wine business. But I uh, I just thought, I can do this. And so I was scared, but I did it. And that was in 1975 with Visa Tui, right? R- right. I wrote a business plan. I was just trying to stay, al- stay alive when I return from Europe. So I was substitute teaching and uh, I was doing anything I could just to pay the rent and have food on the table. And uh, and part of the time I was living in my van to save rent. And so um, I, uh, what I would do, I, I got hired a lot because if the kids got out of line, I'd rough them up a little. <laughs> Go ahead and sue me. I don't have anything anyway. Yeah. All I have is an old Volkswagen van. So I'm not worried about it. So I'd, I'd work on class on my business plan. Uh, I guess I didn't earn my money. And I'd go to doctor's offices, always bring all my papers, because doctors are always half hour, 45 minutes late. Everywhere I, will, I would go, I'd bring my papers, and I'd work on my plan and refine it and ch- change it and so forth. And then, and then uh, by 1975, I was ready uh, to start Visa Tui. And uh, I, uh, in 45 years, we've hardly changed anything in the original plan. Wow. Wow. It is a beautiful location, and it is a beautiful winery making great wines there. But you didn't stop there. Somewhere along the line, you became infatuated or in love with European architecture, specifically castles. And you were driving around for two years in in Europe in a VW van. Talk to us a little bit about that first moment where you fell in love with the the beauty and architecture of Europe and, and how that stuck with you. I think that I always liked architecture. As a little kid, I used to primitively design things, and nobody ever guided me that way, so I I never thought of being an uh, architect, and I always thought uh, what I'd want to do was business. And so I was partially involved with the Visa Tui Winery stone building that we built in 82, 83, and then I was very much involved with the castle. I designed most of it. Um, um, and what happened, I took a sojourn uh, six and a half months, lived in Rome, but I took a lot of excursions. This mm-hmm. is in 89, into the countryside, Umbria, uh, Lazio, Tuscany. And I, I fell in love with medieval architecture. And I'd go day after day, um, uh, at that time, and then subsequently 
either on my motorcycle or in my car. And I go into these old abandoned farmhouses and palaces and, and castles, and and I'd always bring a hammer. I, I have a backpack with a hammer, measuring tape, a sketch pad, uh, and uh, and a camera. Yeah. And uh, if I couldn't get in to find a window to pry, I'd if I had to, I'd force for the door open. Never stole anything. Always hammered back together. And then um, and then if I couldn't get into a place I wanted to, I'd pretend I had some money. I'd go to a realtor and I'd ask them what castles they had for sale. I'd dress up in a suit and tie. And uh, and so I got into a lot of places. And, uh, and but at that point, I didn't have any real money. Uh, so, uh, but then in 92, I did buy a, a monastery that's over a thousand years old, wow. just outside of Siena. Wow. Wow. And, and you come back and you decide, you know, I'm going to look for land to build out this this idea that you have. Uh, you find this cool parcel in Calistoga uh, where Colonel Nash had started one of the first vineyards in, in California. You end up getting 171 acres. You, you know, you have success. You've built Visa Tui, but... Building the castle wasn't an easy thing to start or do from the stories I've heard. Talk to us about, like, the struggles of getting it made. Okay. Uh, first of all, I never intended to build the castle. I love medieval architecture, and I'd taken thousands of photos, and I had floor plans of castles. and I had, But I just did it because I was passionate about it, just because I wanted to do it just from my own uh, self uh satisfaction. So I bought this 171 acres just south of Calistoga because I loved the house. Yeah. And it also had a, a, a three-story Victorian with a wraparound porch. It's really a beautiful home. It has a little lake. It has a lot of forest. It had the history. Colonel William Nash, um, Nashville, Tennessee, was named after his family. Yeah. And, and then I started thinking, first I thought I was replant Nash's Vineyard and sell the grapes to Visa Tui, uh, which I'm the owner of uh, <laughs> most of the, uh, 70% anyway. And then um, and then I thought, well, I'll, I'll build a real small medieval building because I'm so passionate about it. The original 8,500 square feet building morphed into about a 145,000 square feet uh, with eight levels, four below ground, most of it's underground, and uh, four above. It has 107 rooms, no two rooms alike. It's all the ideas I saw in Europe. Uh, and, uh, oh, I should tell you this. When I bought the property, again, I bought it for the house. Uh, it came with this great building permit that the former owner took years to get. Wow. And uh, it was for 130,000 square feet of building, the last public tour and tasting permit ever given in Napa County, and that was in January of 1989. Um, I bought the property in '93, and uh, and uh, what, what else? Um, oh, and a production permit for 250,000 gallons. And I wasn't interested. I, I thought of <laughs> spending four to six months a year in Europe. I loved Italy, and um, and I was doing well so Julie, So I didn't I didn't want to. But I started thinking about it. And after a few months, I not only decided to not sell the grapes to Satuli, I decided to to build a building, and then it just uh, it got bigger and bigger. But that was the reason I, I'd given zero value to that great permit. Wow. And I, um, I, um, it probably had a lot of value, but uh, to me it wasn't valuable because I didn't want another winery. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought I'd love to make uh, small lots of Italian style wines, yeah. food friendly wines, and then um, sell them direct to the consumer. Because uh, at Visa Tui, I basically invented selling direct to the consumer. Now, then people laughed at me pretty much. And, now a lot of them are copying us. 
I've been to the castle several times. I've brought in family and friends down there several times. When I, I used to live in Northern California. Now I live on the East Coast again. And oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I love Northern California. I used to live up in Chico area. And yeah, so yeah. we would drive down and do day trips down there. Now, when I went to the castle, there's the front end of the castle. And then there's like the crush pad, I think, is what it is. And then behind it is the uh-huh. smaller building. Was that smaller building the original building? No, um we started building uh, January of 1995, and we worked 10 years underground. Mm. And uh, as I told you, there's most of it's underground. There's four different levels, one below another, below another, below another. And um, so then we, after about 10 years, we started working above ground, and, um, and we put on a lot more people. I thought I was going to die of old days before I ever... <laughs> completed it but we basically quadrupled the number of people wow and and we we finished it in about 2009 yeah yeah i uh i i once heard on one of the tours that you have the largest underground network of uh wine storage in napa for one location is that right no that i don't know i i i i can't comment because i really don't know okay it's uh, large, but and we also have um, caves as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I find it fascinating. You take and you build this, and it seems like it was a real big passion project, something that you just loved doing. Walk us through. Absolutely, I I, I was crazy about it. I I, I worked in the evenings. Uh, I, I, I yeah, I was totally involved. Uh, I go up there every day. I live at a uh, house at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. But uh, every day, and I, I worked with them. I, 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 I tried to get them to get it right. You know, it's, it's hard to convey your vision to um, other people. Mm. In fact, what I found, t- to a large degree, it was better to have non-skilled people, because skilled people were, um, what can I say? They did it their way, the way they thought it should be done, where unskilled people were more open to being taught to the way I wanted it done. Well, and especially with what you're building, your passion seemed to be about historical accuracy. Can I build something that is accurate to what I've seen and experienced in Italy? I was scared to death because Napa is a small place, and uh, people often ostracize people that <laughs> make a fool out of himself, and I was really afraid of uh, making a fool out of myself. I had nightmares over it. I oh, wow. had only in my lifetime I built a chicken coop when I was younger, a rabbit hutch, and uh, uh, in one other um, a little house for animals when I was in 4-H. And then I worked a little bit on on the Visa Two a stone building, and then I took on the castle. So I was really scared to death, and. Um, and but and so but I was determined to get it right. And when things were wrong, we even tore them down and did it again. I was and I kept taking trips to Italy to to look at things again because I was determined I had to get it authentic as best I could. And 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 I and I really enjoyed the project, so I wasn't in any hurry anyway. I I know from being in California and having a lot of friends in the construction world that California is incredibly rules-driven on what you can and can't do for building. And yet you're able to figure out ways to work around certain – not necessarily break the rules, but you're able to figure out ways to to create the history there, to to represent the history while bending around the rules to make the rules work with the design. Well, put it this way, the county, they were son of a gun. That was the <laughs> hardest thing I had to deal with was the county. And I almost gave up on the project several times. And finally, I went back to it because the county gave me such a hard time. I hope none of the uh, employees of the county are listening to this. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it was really tough. But uh, uh, that was the b- biggest obstacle I had was a county and all the regulations. For instance, they made me put made me put fire sprinklers in cross vaulted brick ceilings that couldn't possibly burn, 
and all you had to do was if they if they could possibly burn, which they couldn't, um, you just step out into the courtyard. Yeah. So you don't burn. And but uh, just stupid. You know, a lot of it makes sense. I, you know, I don't want to say uh, all the regulations are stupid, but some of them were absolutely ridiculous. Again, I hope the county's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> As we wrap up this first segment, there's always three questions we ask. The first one being, how do you find purpose in what you do? I, you, you may not believe this, but I never think of money as being primary. I think that I do things for personal satisfaction to prove maybe that I'm not a total uh, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> and, and, and also for fashion. And I also think that if you do, if you do something for money, yeah, you may make money, but if you do it with passion, because you really believe in it, you really want to do it, you'll probably make more money. Yeah. And, and the former, you know, you're just a prostitute. You're just doing it for the money. Or if you put your heart and soul into something, then I think you'll, in the long run, you'll come out better financially. What is one challenge you're currently working to overcome? We're going, <laughs> we're going before the county again <laughs> for the use permit modification, and it's going to be horrendous. I know it already, wow. uh, and uh, and that's a big challenge for us right now. What's uh, what's the new use that you want to add on? Um, we we I grew so fast that uh, that I um, I started expanding my tasting rooms and we took out some certain rooms we took out the barrels and made them into tasting rooms but I did it without a permit we didn't change the building at all but we changed some of the functions inside the building mm. and um, and I didn't even think about a permit uh, you know I wasn't trying to break the law i just never thought about it i just did it and and the county now is pretty upset about it and so we're trying to get all that sanctified and uh so we'll see what happens you've done so much and built a lot of really cool things in what you're doing what's the next big dream or idea or goal that you have i i don't know i um you know, I own several things in Italy. I bought a Medici palace about eight, ten years ago. I bought a, a chateau in France along a river. It's really beautiful. And um, um, and I, I enjoy that. I enjoy travel. I enjoy friends. I enjoy reading uh, uh, and good music and, and especially good wine and food. Um, I don't know. You know, I have a couple projects of mine. But I'm 78 years old now, so, you know, will I do them? You know, if I'm 10 years older, probably I would do them, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so, um, in any case, I have some I I'm always full of ideas. I, I always wonder why people are, are not employed. If, if you're not employed, create something. Yeah. You know, uh, go shine shoes in the corner. You know, there, there's something... That, that, that everybody has a talent, yeah. and uh, and 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 each talent is different. So uh, I I think that if you, if you can't find a job, create a job. That's why I see it. Love that. We're going to take a break right here. When we come back, we're going to talk about the wines. We're going to talk more about the castle. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll be right back. There is a lot going on here at Jumble Think, and we want to keep you in the loop. There are two ways to do it. You can sign up for a newsletter. That way we can drop a note to you right in your inbox to let you know what's going on here at Jumble Think. And we can connect on social media through Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. You'll find all of those links and the newsletter sign up simply by going on over to jumblethink.com. So head on over right now. Let's connect. And let's do this journey of chasing dreams and ideas together. Now let's jump back into today's conversation with Dario Satui. We are back with Dario Satui. All right, you know, there 
is a lot of cool vision and stuff that you're creating, but you also have a business that you're running. Uh, you create great wines. You have great uh, appeal from a, a visitor standpoint, people coming to see the wines. I was just going through, I have a couple of bottles of your wine uh, sitting in front of me right now in, in my office, actually. And love what you're creating. I think my favorite is the Gewustraminer. And I also like your cabs. Super good. You have a specific style that you create in wines. Why this Italian style wine? Why, why are you passionate about that specific kind of winemaking? Well, I I have a real affinity for Italy. I've had the monastery since 92. I've, I've drank a lot of Italian wines. I've, I've met some of the Italian winemakers. Uh, and so... And and my heritage is Italian, and uh, um, that's how I grew up. So I I think it's pretty natural that I'm more um, involved and want to be involved in Italian style wines. And and we also have some. We have Merlot, we have Cabernet, we mm -hmm. have Chardonnay, mm -hmm. but if you cast well, mainly Italian wines, and at Visa too, we have a lot of Italian uh, varietals as well. You. We're mentioning in, in the first segment as we were going to the break that a lot of people focus on the money and they, they miss the, the ability to create because they're so focused on the money. Now, with building a castle, and I've seen all kinds of different numbers about how much it costs to, to buy the land and, and build the castle, there was a lot of investment there. Were you looking at the business opportunity when you built that or were you looking from the standpoint of this is something I want to build and then I'll figure out how to make money off of this later or was, you know, how did that, how did you bounce that? I didn't even know if I would make money. I, 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 all I knew, something inside me made me want to build the building and to express um, my creativity or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I had no idea if, uh, you know, I had uh, I didn't sleep very well the night before we opened, mm. and uh, then I went up to the drawbridge to see if anybody would come. I didn't know if I'd totally made a fool out of myself or not, and so I had no idea. Although some people, you know, some people said, "Oh, it's going to be another thing like Disneyland, and it's going to be <laughs> faux and fake," and and um, and and uh, I think a lot of people talked behind my back. I heard it from some of my friends, and so. I was scared to death. I, all I knew was I just wanted to express myself, and hopefully I wouldn't lose my shirt doing it. And so that's that was my attitude. You decide to make wine there and sell it, but you decide to go a route that most wineries wouldn't do, and that's simply we're going to go direct to consumer. You either have to come here or you have to order directly from us. A lot of restaurants or a lot of wineries, they're shooting to be in – uh, as much retail as they can, as many restaurants as they can. Why pick to to be hyper focused on? You can only get it if you come directly to us. First of all, I, in the beginning, it's Italy. I didn't know how to sell my wine. That, that was one thing. And uh, and and why give away fifty percent or more? Um, when you can retain that, mm -hmm. what you need is a location. Mm -hmm. And um, I went out of, I studied zoning maps and did traffic studies and all kinds of things. It's so until we I found one of only, well, I found three commercial properties along the highway, Highway 29. Yeah. And I picked one of them, which I bought. And um, that way we could have the deli and the picnic grounds. So I had a competitive advantage because um, nobody else basically could do that. And um, so why give away all that margin? And yes, our expenses are higher than they would be if if we were wholesaling to a distributor. But on the other hand, I don't have to go around the country uh, promoting our wines. I don't have to send my winemaker. My winemaker stays here and makes the wine instead. And I don't have to give away a lot of margin, and and you know you get in, you know if you're a few really notable wineries, um, you have all the power. Mm. But if you're Joe Blow Winery just starting up, yeah, a distributor or two will take you, and they'll put you in their book, but they won't do anything for you. Um, you know they they want to be order takers. They want it easy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you go with them, you go to Chicago, wherever you go. 
um, they'll, you know, they'll go around with you and act like they're really going to sell for you. And as soon as you leave, they'll, they'll stop selling the wine. So I think it's really tough for small, new, unknown wineries to make it. And that's why I believe so many wineries are now, in the last 10 years or so, trying to sell direct because otherwise they simply can't make it. So it's that simple. You you know you, you mentioned here that V Satui you're trying to figure out the the land where you're going to put it you uh, are able to put the deli there you have a great picnic area at that location and you're able to c- create a place that people come and uh, don't just buy a wine but they can actually stay and and spend some time with their friends there but this is early on in the whole Napa Valley kind of creation of of it as the center of American wine. Uh, you've got Chateau Mantellina, which uh, has played into, you know, at least the folklore of some of that. There was a lot of risk for you to step out and and start that. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about, it seems like you were able to overcome the fears of stepping out in business. How do you know when you can leverage and step out and how you can't and when you shouldn't? Well, I I think it's a pretty long, involved discussion, but I think when you don't have much capital, I only had $8,000, um, and I was living in my van, and, and uh, you know, I did, you know, I took cold shower, I did everything I could, uh, but when you don't, you don't go after the entire market, you, you go after a niche, and you try to define what niche you really want to go after, and and then can you do it differently, or can you improve upon what is already being done. And then um, you, you ask yourself, am I being realistic? Is there really a probable um, uh, 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 probability for success? Or am I just kidding myself? Or is it just my own ego that's that's talking here? And um, I, 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 you ask yourself, I would think, what can I do differently or better than, a, than the competitors that are now in the field. And how can I distinguish myself from those competitors? And then I would, you know, I think one should ask himself, do I have a business head? And I thought I did. I love business. I told you I started the little operations when I was nine years old. I always made some money. I mean, high school, grammar school, college, you name it. And um, even in Europe, <laughs> I made a few dollars. So in any event, um, um, uh, and if you don't think you have a business head or you, or you don't have any experience, um, you might ask yourself, well, is this the right thing for me? Should I really uh, go into a business? And then, for instance, if, you're, if you want to go in the wine business, I would not ask as a primary question, how am I going to make great wines? Instead, I would ask, how am I going to sell the wines I make? There are a lot of wineries making really good wines. And the question is, how are you going to sell them? Because you've got thousands of wineries that are going to be your competitors, many of whom are making really good wines. So that's the key question to me. How are you going to sell your wines? And um, if you're really passionate about your... and I'll tell you frankly, I never done any market research. I just figure if I love something to a great extent and I'm really passionate about it, I'll bet there are other people love it just like I do. And if I'm only going after a small segment of the market, I bet if I use my head or I have some common sense, if I budget properly and so forth, that that maybe I can pull this off. And so... um, you know, I've got a bunch of others, but I don't know if you want to go into them. So. Well, it sounds to me like for you, especially with the winery and the castle, part of its location, part of it is is the wine is really good wine that you're making. But beyond that, it's part part of the story. You're you're not just selling wine; you're selling the story of the wine and and why it's special and why people can connect with that. Is is that part of what you're saying from that standpoint of the niche? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, that was something I was thinking about earlier. Um, I think that the sales we have at the castle 
uh, 45 salespeople. Many of them are part-time, but about 45, and most of them show up on a Saturday. Um, and I think the relationship that that salesperson forms with the visitor is almost as important and maybe in some cases more important than the quality of the wine that you're serving to that visitor. Um, I've There's some people that are just really good at bonding with a visitor they've never met before. And I have certain salespeople that sell the heck out of wine and they, they, some of them don't even know that much about wine. Mm. But they do it because they're able to form a bond with the person uh, on the other side of the counter, and and they and, and they even they have a following often, and the, that person when they come back to the castle or Visa Tui, they only want to deal with that that salesperson, and some of the salespeople I have, I, I mean, they're so good. I, I warn some of the customers jokingly, watch out, they're going to take your car, they're going to take your house, and yeah, you're going to go in debt after, after you <laughs> do a tasting with this guy. And, 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 and some of them, many of them say to me, I know it, but I just love this guy. And in other, in other words, we deal with some, you know, pretty sophisticated people, and they know they're, they're being sold. But I think that, again, yeah, I, I believe our wines can rival those of uh, j- just about anybody. But it's the relationship, the bond that the salesperson and anybody, uh, when you come in, is it a warm and natural welcome? Is it, uh, is anybody, any employee you confront, um, uh, are, are they going out of their way to treat you better? And I think this is so important. And, um, um, and we go out of our way. We stress this at every meeting. Um, that it's customer service, customer service. And I think that's a key element in, in being successful. I, I've been to the, the Castello several times. And I have to say, every time we felt very welcome, very well received. We felt like no matter how we were dressed or, you know, the car we were going to show up in, we felt like it was a place that everyone was welcome. You were going to be treated well and that you're going to have a great experience. And everyone that we've ever brought there has said the same thing. And and there's been several times that I've even seen you walking around the, the castle talking to people and, and just very approachable. You can tell that there's a love in what you're creating and there's – there's an affinity that the people working there really love being there too. How are you able to create that culture where there's so much passion about the brand, so much love for what you're creating? Well, first of all, I, I think you go to some wineries and the people um, that you interact with, the employees are snobbish, they're arrogant, and they may tend to belittle you if you mispronounce uh, Cabernet or Chardonnay. And I don't do that. We, we, I, I'm middle class, totally middle class, and and um, and uh, if if we have an arrogant employee, we try to get rid of them really fast. We we want people that are humble, that are natural, that can again form a bond, uh, 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 a relationship with the customer, and and some of the. Many of the people that come to Satui or the castle, maybe it's they don't know that much about wine, uh, and uh, maybe they're just starting to drink wine, and the last thing they want is to be belittled or to, made to feel stupid. And when you're warmly welcomed and you can you feel comfortable and free to ask questions, uh, you know, there's a good chance you're going to, you're going to come back. I, I'm i curious, you know, you've created things that other people would look at you and say you're crazy to have tried to do it, and yet you've done it. And there are a lot of people who they choose not to step into the ideas they have or the businesses that they want to create or the things that they want to do because they have family or friends or they're they're worried about what people will think of them if they fail or they'll think about, will somebody just think I'm crazy? You've had to deal with that. If you were talking to someone in that place, what would you tell them? 
Okay, first I'd say nobody starves to death in the United States. Uh, if you fail, you're good. You learn something and, and you figure out what not to do next time, just do it again. And um, when I was at Cal, I um, I ran into a guy, and um, he was educated me a little bit in the business field, and he said he'd failed three times. Wow. Um, um, at a business and the fourth time he did really well. And, um, what's that big, um, building company uh, they're all over the United States. That guy went bankrupt before too. I, I can't think of what the name is, but, uh, and a lot of people have failed, but the, the thing that separates the failures from the winners are okay. You fail or you don't do well. Can just keep going, either overcome the obstacles or do something else, but never give up. And if and if those people who give up, they're the failures. Wow. But those that fail and don't give up, they're often the winners. And you're even a winner if you keep trying, even if you don't do that well. And in my mind, you're still a winner. So um, you have to just, you know, you think everything came easy for us? You know, just take the last six years. Um, we had an earthquake, and then yeah. people didn't come up here for a while. We had four major fires, um, um, and and uh, it's separated by several years. People didn't come up here. Now we have a coronavirus, and we've been closed since March 15th. We sell all our wine at both wineries uh, directly to the uh, customer. We've had everything in the world happen to us. We've had floods. We've had everything. Uh, we've had employees steal money. You name it. It's happened to us, and um, but you just you just keep going, you keep persevering, and uh, and you you just uh, you try to overcome the obstacles and the challenges. As we wrap up this segment, you know, I, I look at what you've created. You've done Visa Tui. You, you've built a castle. You've built another winery. What is the thing that you are most passionate about that you look at and you just go, "This is what I love." Okay, I. You know, I've asked myself that question over the years, and I think what I like most is creating something. And um, had my name not been was my great grandfather's name, Visa Dewey, Vic, Victorio, had his name not been on it, I may have done something else. I, I, I guess I like creating much more than I do like running the day to day operations of a business. And I, I enjoy that too, but the creation part for me is the really fun part. And probably if I were 25 years old and doing it all over and my great grandfather had started a winery, I'd create different businesses and then sell them and then go on and create another one. So that's probably what I would have done. We're going to take a break right here. When we come back, it's rapid fire questions. Later this week, we are finally launching our first ever idea camps with virtual idea camps. We're doing one on an introduction to podcasting and one on do-it-yourself website building. I don't want you to miss these events. And we're doing some really cool things for those friends of ours who are subscribers to our newsletter. So all you have to do is head on over to jumblethink.com, sign up for that newsletter. And when the website goes live later this week, you can register and get a really special really special deal for that event. So head on over, jumblethink.com, sign up for that newsletter. Let's start dreaming together and let's start making those ideas become reality. Now let's jump back into rapid fire questions with today's guest, Dario Satui. We are back with Daria Satui. Are you ready for rapid-fire questions? Yeah, I'll do whatever you like. You're paying me a lot of money to do this show, so (laughs) whatever you like is fine. (laughs) As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I always wanted to be in business. And I remember as a sophomore in high school, um, a history teacher asked me, what are the three things that are most important to me? And I said business, 
girls, and sports in that order, <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's never changed. Love that. What is one? T- uh, t- now I'm ha- I'm happily married. Don't get me wrong, but uh, <laughs> but it, uh, for a good part of my life, <laughs> I could have really done something with my life if I hadn't chased women so much. But in any event, that's the really old stuff. <laughs> What is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? First of all, you know, for one that doesn't have any business experience at all, then I might ask myself, is this what I really want to do, start my own business? And and if you're 40 years old and you've never attempted to do anything, well, maybe if you've been in a managerial position or maybe you have such a great skill that, uh, you've worked for somebody else, and now you can take it on your own. But still, you have to have some business sense. And and if you don't, don't have some business sense and some common sense, um, I, I think there's a high probability it might not work out for you. And uh, now I forgot the rest of the question. What was the rest of the question? <laughs> it was if you have a big idea and dream and don't know where to start. Then I guess what I would do, and I've done this in the past, I've tried to get guidance. I've gone to people that have done well, and I, if I could, I, I tried to sit down with them and, and you know, how did you go about this? How did you? And, and everybody's way is different, but but um, we all have our own path to um, to being successful. But I I I get books on on. Um, uh, there's the, the guy that ran General Electric. Uh, uh, he, he put out a book. He, he died just a few months ago. Now I can't remember the name of the book. Great book, and and um, um, you know on, on, on business. So I talked to people who've had the experience and see what kind of nuggets you can get from them. I'd, I'd read books. Um, maybe you start something really small. Uh, I think if you haven't had business experience. Yeah, if you think your idea is good, go go do it. But maybe you work part time doing it, uh, keeping your full time job, so that you, you you don't risk your entire livelihood. And and then um, no, I had another thought and I forgot. Um, and then uh, if you start really small, you, you'll make mistakes. I made plenty of mistakes. I still make mistakes. But at least it won't cost you that much, and you'll get experience, and and maybe you can um, use that experience to to grow when when you have more knowledge. And for instance, a lot of people, I think they lie to themselves when they make projections. Mm-hmm. Um, we we do budgeting, we do cash flows, all this, and um, and I always tack on. 15 or 20 percent extra, even though I think I know what the expenses are because I've been doing this for some years now. I tack on extra because something's, it's never going to turn out the way you think it is. Mm-hmm. And something's always going to happen. And uh, if something's out of the sky, it's going to happen. You can count on it. You just don't know what. Uh, for instance, Corona, it's happened to us. Yeah. And But we're in good shape because I've, um, we, we have no debt and uh, I have cash reserves and so we're in good shape because I, I tried to look to the future. And and then as far as projecting your um, revenue, whatever you think it's going to be, make it maybe 80% or 75% of that. And can I survive that for a year or two? And, of course, if you keep your full-time job and are, are starting a business part-time, um, then, uh, then maybe it's not as critical. Um, but that's what I would do if I had no business experience never attempted to run a business before, I'd keep my full-time job until you came to a point where, hey, this looks like it's really promising, and um, I have enough experience and knowledge, I can really do this, and then you go forward and and quit your full-time job. Well, was the book that you're talking about the Jack Welsh book, uh, Jack Welsh yep, and the GE Web? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, really good book, so... Uh, what is one change you'd like to see in the world? Well, I'd like to see um, the world's body of nations get along better. Mm. I'm married to a Russian woman, but <laughs> I know the Russians see things much differently than we do. And um, and they have some right on their side, too. And um, 
what else? I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of protecting the environment. Mm -hmm. I'm an advocate of, of not wanting our population to grow. When I was a kid, we were 140 million people. Now we're 330 million. Wow. And maybe the new census will it'll be even higher. So I, I'm, I'm for protecting the environment, and we're, you know, at some point we're going to have to find a new planet because there won't be any more fish, there won't be any more forests, there won't be any more anything. And um, so I'm, I'm a big advocate of that and, and for wildlife, and I, you know, I donate to all those different organizations. And, and so I try to help support them. So I, I guess those are the... And, and uh, what else? I'd like to... <laughs> this is going to be controversial, but I, I, I guess I'd like to cut our military. I don't know why we get involved in all these foreign wars, uh, Afghanistan for 20 years, and come on, and all these people dead, and, and the billions of dollars spent. For what? And and Vietnam, you know, we started that war, and, you know, and then lied to, to the public about it. And uh, I've been to Vietnam. They're great people, and... Uh, you know, I cried the day I left because of all the old people I'd seen, and all the missing arms and legs, and mm. thanks, thanks to America. Anyway, you're probably sorry you asked me the question. But <laughs> <laughs> what do you want your legacy to be? You know, I don't really care. You know, I don't have any portraits of myself or any marble statues or anything like that. Uh, I just hope that... Uh, that people can say when I'm gone or they can even say now that I was honest, that I was fair, that I, um, that I was a decent human being, that, um, I, I tried to treat others the way I wanted to be treated, the golden rule, so to speak, yeah. that I was a, a decent person. I have my faults and, uh, you know, it's hard to see your own faults, but I, I, I have them and, and I know many, and, and probably my wife knows a lot more and won't tell me. But um, but I try to be a good person. And, you know, you can be an ethical businessman. We've never tried just to make quick money. Yeah. We've always looked at the wrong run, treating our customers right, try to give good value, make a real quality product in a, in a, in a beautiful environment. And... and uh, and that's and I try to treat my employees right. We've lent money to key employees on on homes they wanted to buy. I mean, we've done all kinds of things for our employees. And, and on the other hand, I expect a lot out of them, but I also give a lot. And and um, I think it's the right way to do it. It's it's, uh, it's just it's the right thing to do. That's as simple as that. Where do you find inspiration? I think I inspire myself. You know, I, I do read, I do uh, listen to what people say and and uh, so forth. And um, I think I had a good upbringing. And I think that was it. And and um, would try my mom and dad tried to teach me character and morality. And and uh, you know, I screwed around. I I made some mistakes when I was younger. I am sure I still made some mistakes, but. But I, I've tried to lead a good life, and and, and uh, you know uh, I've tried to be um, a, a person that one could admire, not being great or being successful, but just being a, a decent person who cares about others, who treats others the way he'd like to be treated. What is one habit that's helpful in your life? I think I'm a hard worker. I think that. Had I known how tough it was going to be in the wine business going in, I believe I would have done it anyway, but I think I would have paused. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, first, of it, it was really tough. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I had no money, and I was living in my van, and um, I, I didn't own anything. I, I rented all my winery equipment from a home winemaking store. Everybody laughed at me. And, uh, uh, I mean, and I knew it. And But, I, you know, I was survival, you know, uh, uh, that or to think. And, and so, in, in the beginning, I made all my calls to collect. I had a $3 reject door that was my desk and two old barrels. I had a hand crank calculator, 
I paid fifteen dollars for. I, I mean, I did everything I could think of just to stay alive, and I had virtually no furniture when I you know, moved into a, uh, a house. I, I rented the house to, to have more income, but then at one point I took part of the house, and um, and uh, and often I'm so tired from work anyway, twelve, fourteen hours, and I'd, I'd fall asleep on the floor. But we had almost no furniture. But but again, you know, I didn't starve to death. I, I was. I was building something. I knew where I was going. I and I was, you know, my I've been married more than once, and a couple of my wives didn't see it the way I saw it. <laughs> I know they wanted new wall-to-wall carpeting and so forth. No, no, I wanted to reinvest anything I made back into the business. We didn't pay a dividend for years and years, but and, you know, I was building a business again. I had a dream. I had a I, 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 I had a vision of where I wanted to go and. And it wasn't easy, but um, to a great extent, I, I got there. In fact, we did better than I thought we ever would do. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? Well, probably how, how difficult the wine business could be. But uh, let's see, is there anything else? And how many <laughs> problems employees can give you? <laughs> I know that pain. <laughs> and, I've and been how, there. <laughs> <laughs> and how difficult it is to... <laughs> to get them to keep going down the same path, mm. you, you know, you you teach them what you want them to know, and and for a few weeks they're doing it, and then they start going off to the left or off to the right, and doing it their own way to to some extent. So it, it's just constant mothering, it's constant monitor uh, monitoring, it's constant education, re-education, and. Um, and, and and it's not to say I'm not open to employees' ideas. Uh, I, I always tell employees, if nothing else, even if I don't like your idea, that tells me you care about where you're working, yeah. and and you're you're coming up with ideas because you you care about this place, and and so we're we're totally open to employees. And some of the best ideas I've ever had, they weren't mine; they were employees' ideas. But, I mean, you'd be foolish to be so narrow-minded, to be close to what... I mean, they're, they're at the battle stations. And yeah. so, you know, I'm walking by. I used to do everything they did, but uh, I don't anymore. So they see it more clearly and closely than we do. And so um, I welcome their ideas. Our final rapid-fire question is, what is one dream you are still wanting to fulfill in your own life? I just got married a month and a half ago. Congratulations, uh, by the way. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've been together a long time, and so I, I believe this will work well. And uh, I, I, I want a good relationship with Irina, and um, I, um, I, I, you know, I don't have the energy I, I once had, and um, uh, broke my neck falling off my bicycle. I just had a knee replacement. So I don't know if I'll start any new businesses, but um, I, uh, and I'm trying to raise my son with my, uh, with my um, ideas on how to, how to go forward with life. And uh, fortunately he's listening, um, but uh, you know, whether he, he'll do it. And, and, and of course he has his own ideas and nothing's hundred percent right for, just because it's right for me doesn't mean it's right for him. But in any event, so I um, I want to enjoy more time in Europe. Uh, we just bought this chateau three years ago. We made friends over there, and I want to enjoy it. And so um, I'm still very involved in the castle, a little bit less involved in Visa Tui. And were I younger, I would probably embark upon a couple other businesses because... I've got ideas I believe could work, and um, and but I probably won't do it at this point. So I want to enjoy life, and uh, you know, all my life it has been uh, six, seven days a week. Uh, you wake up in the middle of the night with an idea, you, you write it down, and, and and it's not like I haven't had fun too. I have, but it's um, it, you know, you're, you're interrupted by phone calls, and you, when you're trying to do something else, whatever it is. And, you know, so it's nice to have a little tranquility as well. And um, 
and so you know maybe a, a little more peaceful life. Uh, it's fine. I think at this point I've earned it, so uh, <laughs> I've, I've paid my dues. Yeah. As we wrap up, we always like to leave our guest have a final thought. Do you have a final thought for us today? Um, no, I, I don't have any fit <laughs> <laughs> of me. But I, I will say that I enjoyed being on your show. Uh, uh, you seem like a nice guy. Uh, and the next time you're in um, uh, in California, I hope you stop up and say hello. And um, and uh, I, I thoroughly thank you for um and I encourage um, uh, your listeners to um, consider coming to Visa Tui Winery or coming to the castle. There's a reason why both wineries I own are number one and two in visitation in California. There's a reason for that. Visa Tui leaves the castle, but uh, uh, we see more visitors each winery than any other winery in California. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Once again, I want to thank Dario for taking time out to be on the show. What an honor to have him share his story and all that he's built with us on the show today. I want to also encourage you to go check out what he's built, whether it's Castella di Amorosa or Visa Tui Wineries. He's done some incredible things, and the links to all of those are in the episode notes. So go check them out. And while you're there, why don't you purchase a bottle of wine, have it shipped to you, and uh, have something amazing to drink over the weekend. My final thought for you today is very simple. I love listening to Dario's story. I didn't realize how many people thought his big dream, the, the things he was creating were crazy, and how he risked a lot to step out, his reputation, his wealth, his his fortune to, to build the castle. He took the risk and many of us are worried so often with what will people think of us or what if I fail and yet he stepped out with his passion and pursued it I hope that you will do the same with your dreams and ideas sometimes the bigger they are the harder they are to chase because there's a lot more on stake or in stake and so you have to make the determination is it worth the risk And I hope it is. I hope that you will chase your dreams. I hope you will chase those ideas. And really, it will change the world around you. Thanks so much for tuning in to Jumble Think. Now it's your turn to dream big and to change the world around you. En arrière, sur les côtés, vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant. Dans quelques mois, lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, Vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.